We take our mission statement here at Southgate, making Christ followers of all peoples from the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That is our mission. That is the work that God has called us to as a church. That is the work that God has called us to as individual believers. Everything that we do, whether we serve the Lord in a full-time vocational, pastoral, professional ministry role, or whether we serve the Lord in a non-vocational ministry role, we serve the Lord in our spheres of influence, if we're not, uh, if we don't have a job yet and we're a student, where we are serving as a student, we're serving the Lord, this mission is applied to all of us, right? It doesn't matter. If you name the name of Jesus Christ, if God has redeemed you, he has opened your eyes to the reality of your sin. He's opened your eyes to the reality of what Christ did for you. And you have put your faith and trust in Jesus alone, not in my good deeds, not in my church attendance, not in because I help little old ladies cross the street and because I washed my neighbor's car and because I do all of these good things, but because of what Jesus has done. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus' work alone for your salvation, then you are a follower of Christ and you are commanded to do this. Make Christ followers of all peoples, all ethnic groups, all language groups, all people groups, all gender groups, all age groups, all socioeconomic groups, everybody. That's your job. That's my job, right? And we say amen to that. And we say amen to that. How are we doing how are we doing with this task of making Christ followers of all peoples? It's hard to measure sometimes in churches. It's hard to quantify. We could give an invitation every Sunday, and we could call people by the masses to come down and to commit their lives to, to Jesus Christ, to, to, to put their faith and trust in Him, and we could draw a lot of people down the aisles but does that mean that they've genuinely experienced salvation? Or did they just walk an aisle? Did they just pray a prayer? It is possible for people to understand the gospel and to still be lost and on their way to hell. It is possible for people to walk an aisle at the end of a church service and still be lost and go to hell. God is very clear that his salvation is not just a salvation from the consequences of our sin in this life, but his salvation is uh, to deliver us from the consequences of our sin in the afterlife, because we will continue to live someplace after we physically die, and there's only two options that the Bible describes. The first is heaven in the presence of the God who created us, and the second is in a place called hell where there is eternal fire and there is eternal punishment and torment. And people wrestle to get their head around that particular idea because they say, how can a good and loving and kind and compassionate God send people to a place like that? Let me ask you this question. How could a good and loving, kind and compassionate God, who was also holy and who was also just, how could he not, if people choose to reject the only way that he's provided for salvation? He is obligated to be just. He is obligated to be righteous because that's a part of his character. It's a part of who he is. And in order to be just and righteous in his character, he must punish sin. And the Bible says that all of us 
regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of our socioeconomic status, regardless of any of those categories that we've described before, all of us have sinned and fallen short of his glory. His standard of perfection is so high and so far above and beyond us that there is nothing that we can do to merit it, to attain it, to grab a hold of it in our own strength. But the verse that Isaiah shared in his testimony, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrated his love for, it, for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to clean up and take a bath. He didn't wait for us to, to put on our best and say, okay, Lord, now I'm ready to receive you because I'm a good person now. He came and demonstrated his love by dying for us when we were reprehensible, when we were repugnant in his eyes. When our sin was flying in his face, he sent Christ to die for us so that we could have forgiveness of sin. That is an amazing salvation. And that salvation is the means by which we can receive forgiveness of sin, the promise of eternal life, and the escape from the condemnation and the punishment of hell. And God has been orchestrating this story from Genesis 1. In the beginning, the Bible says, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything that we see around us. He created us, man, from the dust of the ground. In Genesis chapter 2, it says that he breathed into man, in man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God created us. God gave us breath. He gave us physical life. And then he placed this man into a garden and said, take care of it, rule over the earth, subdue it, be fruitful and multiply. And to be fruitful and multiply, he gave the man a woman that he created from the rib of the man. And she was to be the helper to Adam to accomplish the mission that God had given him to represent him in the world. And we know from our favorite chapter, Genesis chapter 3, that man fell from this condition. Man disobeyed God in the garden and ate from the one tree that God said, don't eat of it because in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And a lot of people say, well, pastor, when you read that story, they sinned, but they didn't die. They didn't die right away, but there was something that significantly changed in their relationship with God because now they could no longer walk in the garden naked like God had created them. Now they had to have clothing that covered them, and God provided an animal for them to be clothed so that they could be covered. And that was the picture, a foreshadow, of what God was eventually going to do in Christ with the covering of Christ's blood when it was shed for us. It was the, the foreshadow of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament that would point eventually to Christ and to the sacrifice that he would make for us. God created us. We rebelled against him. And because of that, we experienced sin and sin in the, or sorry, we experienced death. And death in the scriptures never refers to a secession of life. It always refers to separation. Man was separated from God in that act of sin, and when we die physically, we experience the separation of body from soul, but we don't cease to exist. And God, as he is orchestrating his plan, the scripture says, before the foundation of the world, provided the means by which we could escape this death that he says is the consequence of our sin. And the means by escaping this death, we know, comes in the person of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was here, he was God in the flesh, 100% man, 100% God. And he lived a sinless, perfect life. And when John the Baptist was baptizing uh, down by the river, people were coming for a, his baptism to identify with the teachings of John, and he sees Jesus coming, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
He was acknowledging that Jesus was going to be the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament sacrifices that required the shedding of blood in order to be covered by their, or in order to have their sin covered so that a holy God could look at them. And he says, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And he baptized Jesus not because Jesus needed his sins forgiven, but to publicly identify Jesus as the Messiah and to incorporate his mission to redeem people from every nation. And Christ came, and he lived, and the Bible says he died on the cross. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way that we can be accepted in the eyes of God except through Jesus Christ. No other religion, no other world philosophy, no other ideology. It's Jesus Christ alone. His claim was exclusive, and that wreaks havoc in our culture because we don't like exclusivity. We don't like to be on the outside of something. We want to be inclusive and say, everybody, you can believe whatever you want to believe, and you can do whatever you want to do, and that's fine, and that's your truth, and that's okay for you, but my truth is different from your truth. But Jesus said, no, I'm the only way. And because he was God, he could say that. And he proved that he was God by performing many miracles and by raising people from the dead. But he proved it most significantly when he came back to life himself. Amen? He didn't stay in the grave. We celebrated that at Easter a couple months ago. He didn't stay in the grave And because he didn't stay in the grave, he proved that everything that he was teaching, everything that he was doing was true and right, and he proved that he was God. And we just, our minds, man, our minds just spin with that. But the cross was the means by which we could be saved. Consider what 1 Peter says in chapter 2, verse 24. Peter writes these words, about Christ bearing our sins for us. He says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were strain like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. He bore our sins. He took our punishment so that we could escape the punishment of God. That's mind-boggling. That's a part of God's story from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. Christ is the only means of salvation. We can't do it ourselves. He died for us. He bore our sins. How many of you have ever been in school and the teacher says, if you guys are good, you're going to get a treat? It could be recess. It could be an extra gym period or it could be something that's Like, you remember those days? So Some of you are like, "Uh, that was a really long time ago. But do you remember those days? Kids, teenagers, how many of you remember those days? Your teacher says that. And all it took was one person. And one person messed it up. Well, now you guys can't go outside. You can't go to recess. Why, teacher? Well, because Johnny over here, he broke the rule. And I said if you guys were good and he wasn't. And now now you guys got to stay inside. Do you remember that? Do you remember wanting to lynch that little kid, right? Because he blew it for all of us. Adam was that little kid. He blew it for all of us. But yet God looks down and says, I'm going to fix it. And all through the pages of Scripture and all through of time and history, God has been working out this plan of redemption, and it was fulfilled in Christ when Christ came. He was God, he was man, he died, and he took our punishment so that we could have, forgive me for saying this, recess to fit the illustration. He took our punishment. Because of the disobedience of the one man, Adam, all of us became sinners, but because of the obedience of the one man, Christ, all of us now can be called sons of God. And that is phenomenal. And it's Christ who makes that happen. And he made it happen 
when he died on the cross. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again. But the Bible says that we have to put our faith and trust in him. You remember the thief on the cross? When Jesus is being crucified, the thief on the cross looks over. The other criminal that was on the cross next to Christ, he's blaspheming Christ. He's mocking him. He's ridiculing him. And the thief on the cross says to the man, hey, man, basically, he says, shut up. He says, you're getting what you deserve. I'm getting what I deserve. But this guy's done nothing wrong. And then he looks at Jesus and he says, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, today you will be with me where? In paradise. The thief on the cross didn't have the opportunity to publicly declare his faith in the waters of baptism like we do. But Jesus said, on the basis of your faith, you will be with me in paradise. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through working hard and being good and being kind and loving people and doing all of the right things. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Belief. I believe I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus is God. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he rose again for me. And I ask him to save me. And I place all of my faith on him. And I sit on him. And I trust him that he's going to save me. That's what the Bible teaches It's the mission that he's given to us is that we would make everybody know this story and have an opportunity to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says that when you believe in him, you will be given life. And in Baptist churches, we talk about life and we think about John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that is true, we get everlasting life, but we also get life to the full now. At the moment that we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we get eternal life right then. Our eternal life has started right now. We're experiencing it now. We're going to experience it into eternity, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus did. Right? That's good news. That's phenomenal news. This is the story God has been telling through time in history. It's the story that is pictured in that act of baptism. This is what God has done for us. And when we're baptized, we say to everybody, I am a part of that story. I've experienced it. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior. That's something to get excited about, right? And yet why... In many churches across the country, do we sit and we hear that story and we're like, amen, the joy of the Lord is my strength. This gospel message should transform us. This gospel message should create us into new people. Yes, as one of the, uh, uh, Mandy, I think, in her testimony says, we're still going to sin. But we still get forgiveness because Christ still died on the cross for us. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? That doesn't give us a license to go and sin and do whatever we want to do because Paul says, God forbid. But God works this transformation and it comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus called it the new birth in John chapter 3. He says, unless a man is born again, he shall not, he shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to talk about that more in the weeks to come because that's a part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the new birth. But here today, if you have never come to that point in your life where you have put your faith and trust in Jesus alone for salvation, you stand condemned before a holy God. And unless you repent and put your faith in Jesus, you will suffer eternal consequences. Well, preacher, how can a good and loving God do that? 
Did you hear the story that I just told of how God has been working out his plan of redemption from Genesis to Revelation? And if people choose to ignore that, he is obligated by his character to punish sin. You can either choose to have Christ take your punishment for you, or you can bear that punishment yourself in eternity. And I guarantee you, the former is better than the latter. Oh, at Southgate, we want you to know Jesus. We don't want you to know about him. We want you to experience the new birth. We want you to experience the gospel. And then we want you to join us as we go and take this gospel message all over Clark County, all over the state of Ohio, all over the nation that we live in, and to other nations around the world so that we can make Christ followers of all peoples. Will you stand with me and bow your head and close your eyes? We're going to pray. There's something about Baptism Sunday that makes you get excited because you hear these wonderful stories of how God has worked in people's hearts. And I want to put out a challenge to you this morning. If you don't know Christ, you've not experienced the new birth you don't know what it means to place your faith in Jesus. Man, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that. We're going to have some folks up here at the front that as the service closes, if you want to talk to somebody and say, hey, explain this to me again. I think I'm getting it. We'd love to sit and talk to you about that. Father, we ask that you would take all that we've done here today the singing, our giving of our financial resources, watching the testimonies, watching people publicly declare their faith and enter into the waters of baptism, and even this short message that we've kind of talked about, giving a summary of the scriptures. Father, I pray that you would take all of what we've done today and use it to bring new life to somebody today that doesn't have the life of Christ. Father, I pray that you would use this to open blind eyes, to breathe life into spiritually dead people so that they can come to the point where they embrace the cross. Father, for those of us who have heard this story over and over again, and we, we've made a profession of faith at some point in our past, and we've experienced the new birth, but for whatever reason, we're clinging on to sin, and we're, we're mucking about, and we're messing things up, and we're not being responsive to you. Father, I pray that you would use this time to bring conviction to our heart, that we would repent and confess and experience once again the great forgiveness that Christ offers to us and that you would renew our hearts so that we can serve you more effectively. Father, if you were to hold our transgressions against us, none of us would be able to stand. Sometimes, Lord, we do struggle. We say, how can a good and uh, a loving and kind and compassionate God send people to a place like hell? Instead of asking, how could a good and holy and loving God, who is just and righteous, allow us into heaven in the condition that we're in? Father, you took it upon yourself to change our condition. And we pray that you would help us to experience it first of all, and then secondly, to go and share this wonderful news with everybody that we meet. We'll give you thanks for that, Lord, and we'll give you the glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to talk to somebody about your spiritual condition, please come and talk to somebody today. Have a great day. And ladies, as you go, there are flowers on the tables in different spots in the building. Take one of those as a gift. Happy Mama's Day. <laughs>